Uh, here's a thing that uh, that's becoming more popular, and I like this instrument for doctors because they may not be the most charitably inclined, you know, inclined group of people around. So they may want some some benefit, even as they want to help their healthcare institution. Okay. So instead of surrendering money, say fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, to the healthcare institution as an outright gift, they will put money uh, into a. Charitable gift of duty. Okay? Charitable gift of duty. So they load this with a hundred thousand dollars. And they can receive the derivative income of that amount. Okay? Uh, and a lot of times, they don't want the money now, but they will have a deferred charitable gift annuity such that when they retire, they will have money, derivative money from this account. Now, you can put this money, this annuity, in SunTrust have the derivative amount come from some trust, but there, there are no tax advantages there. But if you give it and set it up with a charity, you get um, some tax advantages. And here's, here's another thing that's really neat. If you give this to a charity, your percentage derivative income is going to be a little sweeter than what SunTrust can pay you, than the market rate it's going to be a little sweeter than the typical market yield, okay? So, uh, let's just say it's a deferred gift annuity, the, the doctor becomes 65, retires, and you have all of this money, uh, that the derivative income given to him in his or her retirement, the person dies, that money goes to the charity. Okay, that money goes to the charity. The original hundred thousand, or the that that that's it. Okay, right. now this this is the bet. Because this derivative income is has a higher interest rate and is a little sweeter than the market interest rate. This corpus is going to erode somewhat through the years. So much so that I'm told that typically at the, on average, when, when the person dies, there may be only 50% of the corpus left because they're paying out more than the market returns. So there's some erosion but typically, still, the charity is going to get 50000 on about average as a result. Now, again, this benefits the doctor and benefits the charity. So, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Now, it, there's such a thing as a charitable gift annuity, trust, and a charitable gift unity trust. A unity trust is a fixed percentage. A, an, a, a unity trust, uh, uh, an annuity trust is a fixed dollar amount. Okay? So, so people, if they want a fixed dollar amount, and they want that security of having something fixed, 
they want a charitable gift annuity trust. But with a, a unity trust, um, it will be a fixed percentage, but based on the value of the corpus, this amount can amount of derivative income can go up or down. Now, I'm not trying to make you all experts, I'm just trying to kind of introduce ideas to you about how these instruments work. And I'm telling you things a little bit clearer than the truth, you know. <laughs> you know, these things are complex instruments and I'm kind of giving you a broad brush understanding of how these things work, you know. If I were given a test, I'd make a C, you know, but I went through college with gentlemen with C's. And so there you go. Um, but that that's kind of how this works. Yeah. Generally speaking, who owns the hundred thousand once the thing is created? <laughs> Generally speaking, the the uh, the charity does. All right. And the charity, but the charity. Here's the other thing that's interesting about charitable gift annuities. A charitable gift annuity is a contract that is written between the organization and the donor. It is a contract and that means each person has to hold up their end of the deal. So typically charities that offer charitable gift annuities have to have enough umph and gravitas and enough asset value and wherewithal before they'll even take the bet on a charitable gift annuity. We have a donor in Lafayette that uh, has given four charitable gift annuities through the Methodist Foundation and they, they always, it's four or $10,000 each and the foundation people are always telling me, well, if she lives too long, then we're not gonna get any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to keep paying. They and I money. think somebody has run numbers to say that people who do these charitable gift annuities, may, you know, live a little longer, you know, yeah. on the, on the, on yeah. the table. And, and the foundations on the hook, they could actually pay out, they could, they could go in the hole, right? Yeah, yeah, in theory, in theory. But if you have enough asset girth, yeah. you know, these are bets that you're willing to take. Right. At least, you know. Just these bean counters can kind of just point to the fact that okay, you're at a point where you can absorb this. Yeah, and okay. the interest rates that are given, it's all actuarial yeah. done by your age. Yeah, so it, exactly. Yeah, so that's yeah. a big. If the older you are, you might get a higher interest rate, but you yeah. probably won't live as long versus yeah. probably 20 yeah. years younger. It, exactly. And and you thanks have, for making that. You point. generally have to be a minimum age to get. Them all. Yeah. I was about to say, once you get to about 83, 4, and 5, they won't even write them anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because you have lived, they can't afford it to pay it out. If you're 83, 4, or 5, now, I'm, I'm asking, I, uh, it seems like if you're older, me as a nonprofit, I will take that bet, one because I, you you put you load it with a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm thinking, all right, that money's going to be mine pretty soon. Okay. Yeah. We'll do the set of stage twice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the here's the other thing uh, that I want to point out. There is such a thing as a charitable remainder trust. Effectively, it's the same dynamics as this, but this dynamic is different than this in that this is a contract between the organization and the donor. A trust is kind of a, a separate legal fiction, you know, that's set up, and uh, typically this is done out of a financial institution, okay? So there's, there's not the exposure, but you can have money put in a remainder trust, the derivative income goes to the donor. Donor dies, the remainder of the trust goes to the charity. Same kind of dynamic, but it's just different kind of ownership relationships, okay? If you're a small nonprofit, you would prefer which instrument over the other? 
the remainder trust. The remainder trust. You're less exposed. Okay. Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, so. Look on page 60, if you will. You know, let me just, just say this. Puna Lens Income Funds have kind of lost their luster. And uh, a lot of times, pooled income funds, you know, the money that's there will be moved to a gift annuity or, or something, you know, along those lines. But that's an instrument that's kind of uh, outlived its, its time. Um, but that's where a lot of people threw money into a pot and they, they, they kept a fund within that pooled income fund. They kept their own individual fund. But it's cumbersome, laborious, uh, it's not very neat or clean. It's kind of clustered and discombobulated. Okay. So a gift annuity, uh, who benefits? Smaller contributors? Uh, who may want a fixed return, and that's if it's a, an, an annuity trust. These things, uh, you know, you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but it's really our job to do that. I mean, you know, <laughs> and to assess is this going to cut, you know, in our favor at all. Because if it's not advantageous, we got to just, you know, surrender it and let it go. Which reminds me of something. If somebody does want to give you some land, uh, the thing that you're going to want to have happen is that first, before you accept the land, that you do a phase one environmental. Because mm -hmm. it may be that that land that somebody wants to graciously give you is despoiled property, you know, that has some environmental hazard. If you take that property, you've got to clean it up, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> a lot of times I've heard war stories of, you know, on December the, the 30th, there'll be somebody calling saying, oh, I need a tax advantage, I need to give you this land so I can get a deduction, you want this land. And uh, unbeknownst to this person, uh, didn't know about phase one environmentals and you know they said okay we'll take the land and you know everybody wins when everybody doesn't win. It was just a way to dump somebody's problem onto an organization. So that's why you need to have when you have a plan giving program you do need to have gift acceptance policies in place and that protects you uh, as the development. It protects the organization from some of the worst downside risks, okay? Yeah, we're doing that policy and procedure revamp, and uh -huh. we're including a multi-page real estate gift evaluation requirement. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just a matter of, yes, we'll take it. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, we've got to go through this multi-phase yeah. Yeah. Multi evaluation, yeah. appraisals, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, so yeah. It just gives you, gives you a chance to evaluate it before you just take, take a step field. back. Yeah, exactly. And you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Just say, I'm sorry, but this is a policy and it's in place for, you know, for, for good reason. So.